Thank you. It's 6.30 p.m. and I'd like to call this meeting of the Community Development Committee to order. While this meeting is being held in person, we are also offering the option for the public to participate through Zoom if preferred. Instructions on how to attend virtually are included in the City Council calendar items listed on the front page of missionks.org. The public is also invited to participate in the meeting. If you're participating via Zoom, please either add your comment to the chat feature and it will be read out loud or note that you would like to speak and we will call on you shortly to make your comment verbally. Please remember your comments or questions are visible to everyone in the meeting. If you are part of our in-person group tonight, please raise your hand, but stay seated and we will call on you to go to the lectern to make your comment. When you make your comment, please state your name and city of residence for the record. Also be conscientious of others trying to speak and speak slowly and clearly. This meeting will be recorded and posted on the city's website at missionks.org. Please contact the administration offices at 913-676-8350 with any questions or concerns. Ms. Fultz, please call roll. Thomas? Here. Boltinghouse? Here. Loudon? Here. Ryard? Here. Kring? Here. Inman? Chosi? Here. Davis? Here. All right, our first item of business tonight is public comment. Is there any member of the public who would like to comment now on an item that is not on our agenda this evening? Okay. We have one public presentation tonight, followed by two items coming forward from the Planning Commission September 25th meeting. Our first presentation tonight is for Mission Family Aquatic Center and Mission Summer Camp Wrap-Ups. Mr. Aloni, will you please begin your presentation? Good evening, Mayor and Council. The 2023 outdoor swim and summer camp season is a finally concluded, and uh, I've invited our aquatic facility manager, Jenna Dickman, as well as our recreation program and event supervisor, Jenny Smith, to share some of the uh, data and insights from this past season. So we'll first hear from Jenna and then Jenny. Hello, thank you for having me. I am excited to share a little bit about the recap of our outdoor pool season. Oh. Okay, some changes we had in 2023. We switched from family memberships to individual memberships. We added lifeguard safety observation sheets. This was basically to give our lifeguards constant feedback of how they were doing to keep our pools safer. Expansion of food choices in the concessions, and we added several new programs. Here's our revenue summary. Membership and daily passes stayed relatively the same year over year. Uh, we saw an increase in concessions. We added several hot food items as well as protein packs that did well. And then we also did combos during our special events that did significantly well there. And you can see that reflected. With the programs, we had a little bit more time to spend adding onto our program. So we added hours for talk time. We added swim and flow hours for those 18 and up. And then we also have fitness classes and events under that as well. So they, they had really good turnouts for all of the events and it went up 368%. So we're pretty proud of that. Couldn't have done it without the staffing level that we had. So um, really proud of that. Rentals did well again this year. Um, we had several throughout the weekends and tons of after hours as well. Super pass is a little bit lower year over year. Um, but that number isn't final because we have a meeting next month to add more depending on the visits. Uh, in total, we had 11% jump from last year in revenue. Our expense summary, um, we did go up in personnel because we increased the wages. And then we also added a bunch of additional hours. Outside of our normal hours of operations, we do staff for the Mission Marlins. And we do those after hours rentals as well. So that contributed to that number as well as the super pass visits, which we'll get into in the next slide. 
um, but we did have to add some staffing. Uh, contractuals, we were, were able to keep relatively lower. Uh, we took over a lot of the pump room work in-house, which helped. And then commodities were kept lower as well um, with a cost recovery this year of 52%. Okay, so this is our visits from memberships and daily passes and super pass visits. We did have similar uh, numbers from memberships and daily passes with a slight decrease. Uh, where we saw a bit of a difference was the super pass visits. We saw a significant increase in Roland Park visits. Um, we started seeing that they were trending about 50 a day, upwards of 90 at times. So we had to add a couple of additional lifeguards to help keep our pools safe with those ratios. Some opportunities for 2024 would be to remain competitive and pay and continue the employee referral program. Those are two items that kept us fully staffed this year. So I would love to continue uh, to be a top place for these lifeguards to come and work. Uh, creating a junior lifeguard program, which is a good feeder program uh, towards our lifeguarding staff in the future. Utilizing our registration software to free up some admin time. A little bit about this, we were able to track our super pass visits on our registration software, which was gave us the ability to uh, track those daily visits and see the trends. So utilizing it to its fullest capabilities and seeing how far we can maximize on that and then a membership rate increase for next year. Some highlights, we had 100 aquatic team members and it was the best team I've ever had. So, uh, and really it was all referrals. So they do enjoy working here and you could see it all summer. So it was a really great team and overall summer events, the yoga on deck under the sea pool party and pool party for pooches had really great turnouts. Uh, under the sea pool party, we saw four to 500 within a few hours, which we were not anticipating. So it went really well. All the new programs we added, we had one rain out day, uh, several lifeguard saves that ended up uh, as just in assist. So they were able to recognize their victims before it became emergencies. We had several improvements, including the leisure pool getting painted, the slide getting painted, adding uh, the toddler swings and new umbrellas. We retained 60 lifeguards going into the fall season. So that puts us in a really good spot for next summer. And then overall positive team and member experience. Oh my God. So small, I printed it out so I could read it. So <laughs> I sent out a survey monkey at the end of the season asking for feedback, um, both what we did well and what we could improve on going forward. 65% uh, of the responses we got were mission residents. So we had a good uh, response, but I wanted to share some of the things that exceeded uh, our members' expectations this summer. Um, a few of them are all the new swim events and activities, the lifeguards who were role models to young kids, love the early pool hours for adults only, friendliness of the staff, regular communications, a very refreshing and welcome change, flexibility in terms of dedicated lap lane times as the season went on, extra hours after school was in session, consistent adequate lifeguard staffing, cleanliness, Love the expanded lane hours in the mornings. Love the movie nights and family-friendly activities. Our kids always love coming to the pool. The lifeguards were cheerful and helpful all year. And then there's some of my favorite pictures. So I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Debbie? Totally awesome job. We are so proud of you. you Thank just, you. You just stand, you guys just stand out. And having you and Jenny on the block here all the time, we just love having that consistency. People know you, they, they mm -hmm. trust you, and you just make us all look good. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, we really do appreciate the, uh, the extra programs. I mean, that made such a big difference, and it really does you know, build that community feeling at the pool when, when people are coming to, to these events and having great experiences. So fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks. Thank you. Hello. Thanks, Council. Thanks, Mayor, staff. Thanks for having us here today. We're excited. Click it. Should I go? Should I click? Might be too. So, hello again. Yeah. We'll wait till it gets going here. You're all right. I know a lot. Don't tempt me. I was just talking to Penn. I really like the new Fallout Boy song that's out right now. So. Sorry, I'm sorry. No, you're okay. It gives me a minute to compose myself. <laughs> so we can blame Penn for that. That's Penn. We're blaming Penn for that one. So sorry, Penn. Oh, he's here. Oh. <laughs> you're good. It's literally the worst when 15 eyeballs are just sitting there staring at you. Click the button. It's so hard. So you nailed it. Emily, good job. I know you're like, whoa, you did really good. Good job. Good job. All right. So I'm going to talk about the 2023 Mission Summer Camp season. We had an excellent year this year. We ran nine weeks. We are licensed with the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. This year we had um, really good staffing levels. So we were at 23 full-time seasonal staff members for our summer camp, which did allow us to take 150 campers this week, which was up from last year. We only took 120. We do anticipate going up again next year, um, again, depending on staffing levels. This was a little bit interesting to me. This year, we had 205 unique campers. Campers are not required to sign up for the full summer. They can pick and choose which weeks they would like to sign up for. This is actually one of our higher numbers of unique campers, which is really good. That means word spreading and families really want to get into our summer camp program. Mission residents, um, we had 21% this year, which was just a scotch lower than years past. And I'm thinking the reason that is, is because a lot of people who work here in Mission are also now utilizing our summer camp, which is really good for us. So we did raise camp fees this year to 151 if you're a resident or a PCC member and 161 if you are not. Um, that did go up $6 from last year. We will increase pricing again next year for 2024 uh, just to cover the rising costs of staff and personnel. We want to make sure we have good staff, so we need to cover those costs. Um, so there's some anticipations for 2024. We're really proud to offer a unique experience for our campers with offering lots of different activities and things that they can do in addition to the day-to-day -day activities with our summer camp. We wanna create a safe and creative space for campers to learn new skills, discover new experience, and then make those lifelong um, friendships that they make in relationships. We did add some new stuff this year. I tried to add a little supplemental item for each week. We did one week where we offered archery to the campers, which was a big hit. I did have the Bainfield Academy from PetSmart come in and do a dog Dog safety. Not all parents love that. I will say that, but it did teach the kids how to approach dogs, how to be around dogs, how to raise dogs and be a better pet owner. Big success. We will do that every year in the future. I also had some of our instructors come in and do some of our youth um, fitness programs just to kind of um, let them explore those opportunities. Our chess camp's always popular um, with our with our kiddos. And so we'll bring that back. Of course, we do the standard swim, tennis, and basketball, which both sessions of those do fill, and we get a variety of different campers in there. In the future, I'm looking to offer a potential dance, art. Um, we have kendo at our facility, and so that might be something that would be interesting to get them um, excited about. And then, of course, pickleball, fastest growing sport in America. So might as well get the kiddos in. They're already playing it in the gym. So some things we're looking to add in the future. Getting into the revenue um, you know, we had a pretty good couple of years these past two years, and that was due to the Child Care Aware grant that we were um, given. It was approximately $241,000 that we were given over the two-year time frame. I got $79,000 in 2023, and so we did go ahead and include it in our revenue. You'll see revenue numbers from Mission Camp fees did go up this year, and of course, that is due to increasing the number of campers that we had, and then also that slight increase in fees uh, as well. So feeling pretty good about that. We did have a 217% cost recovery this year. Expenses did go up. You'll see that. And we're going to talk about that a little bit on the next screen. 
um, reason for that is really personnel costs. So that $30,000 really is covered there in personnel. And that's because we did raise our rates because we needed to stay competitive to other camps in the metro area to make sure that we could get high quality staff to come and work for us. So those are kind of what our expenses look like. Everything goes up. Field trips were a little more expensive. I spent a little less on supplies this year just because with the grant money in 2022, I was able to really up buy a lot of things. And so we were set in a really good space for 2023. So um, I anticipate expenses being pretty comparable for next year. I do like to put this note in here. Since 2019, Kansas Department of Health and Environment has been covering our fingerprint fees. All of our staff are fingerprinted through the Mission Police Department and then sent through KBI background checks to make sure that they're okay to work with children. We anticipate in 2024, those costs will come back to us as the facilities. And that does cost approximately $75 per um, counselor. So just a thought to keep in mind as we move towards next year and we see those costs go up a little bit on the expense side. Kind of talking about some of the fun stuff and the highlights that we had. Again, I've mentioned the Child Care Aware Grant. It equivocated to about $18,000 a month for camp-related expenses. We were able to get some good concrete pads, some new structures in the facility, and a whole lot of new equipment for us to use for the campers um, and youth in our programs and activities. Three staffers were retained in the fall for ongoing employment here at the Powell Community Center, um, which is pretty good. We're, we're happy about that, and we expect them to return next year. Looking to 2024, we want to keep our staff wages consistent and competitive, and so um, that's where those fees are going to go up. Again, we also want to continue to offer unique camp experiences for our campers. This year, all scholarship requests were funded. We do follow the HUD standards um, for who does qualify for a scholarship, um, and it really does make our camp much more accessible to people who might be on a limited income, which we think is awesome and it allows everybody to enjoy our camp. Quite frankly, the whole time I've been here, 2023 camp was the best camp staff in nine summers. So we had a really, really good time. Talking about the unique experiences and the discoveries that our campers have, I, me and Misty, um, who is the new rec coordinator, for those of you that have met her, we received a letter from a camp family at the end of summer. And I wanna share this letter with you because um, it's very powerful, I think. And that she took the time to write this out. That's always a good thing because people usually wanna complain, but they don't always wanna give you the good stuff, right? Um, so this particular family, this was their first summer. Both parents and both children came to our parent orientation, which we offer before camp starts. I get those questions out that everybody asks us over and over again. So we do a presentation. The whole family of four waited until every single person had left the facility, came to me and was like, we have more questions. <laughs> Proceeded to talk to me for an additional 45 minutes after orientation. I answered, 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 wanted them to feel comfortable. We get through summer. This is the letter that this family had sent to us. Jenny and Misty, thank you for an amazing camp experience. You made it look easy and I can only ima imagine the challenges you faced and the time and energy you devoted to making it a success. Your communication shared in my camp app was outstanding. Your turnaround time on direct emails regarding questions or concerns was very timely and much appreciated. The super fun and stimulating activities provided growth and development in our children. The supplemental activities and field trips alternating throughout the week gave them such joy and excitement. Additionally, Wednesdays were always a favorite day thanks to Taste of Aloha. What a genius idea. I'm looking at Robin because I know Claire loves Taste of Aloha. So I truly believe you are offering a phenomenal service to the community and I wanted to share my thoughts and gratitude. I now have children who swim. This is huge. I am so incredibly proud of your staff. Thank you for giving them a fundamental life skill. They will continue to get better each year and cherish the memories made at your facilities. They learned how to apply and reapply sunscreen. Thank you for morning motivational meetings that stress the importance of sunscreen. I heard you coaching them. The crafts were stimulating. They loved making bracelets, perler bead art, and slime. These activities offer a creative outlet that foster critical thinking and encourage self-expression. The physical activities, free play inside and out, helped get out all their wiggles and taught them problem solving, teamwork, and listening skills. It was incredibly heartwarming when our children reflected on the camp experience and explained they would miss their time at Mission Summer Camp. They wanted to know when they would see their favorite people again. A special thanks to Phoenix, Maya, and Jess for fostering a fun and engaging relationship with our children. I heard lots of good things about them. Keep hiring the best. In conclusion, if your mission was offering exceptional programming, you conquered it. Keep up the amazing work. Sign the family. Yeah, thank you. I should, I'm going to keep it. It was a really good email. It was a really good email. So thank you for your time. I can answer any questions if anybody should have any, um, but short of that, it was a great year. I'm always ready to put it to bed and we'll wait till January where we kick it off again for next year. So.
Thank you. Questions? I just want to comment that it's it's great to hear from both of you that raising the wages for the workers made such a big difference in the quality, quantity, mm-hmm. and longevity yeah. <laughs> and referrals right. um, that that has made. It's always good to know that, you know, our decisions resulted in something very positive. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great meeting. Okay, the first item from the Planning Commission is for a final plat of Swig Soda Shop at 5959 Barkley. Ms. Neller, will you please share? You don't get any letters about how awesome plats are? (laughs) No letters or anything. (laughs) Dang it. Oh, ice cream, Aloha next time. I don't know. (laughs) Bribes. Um. Yeah, so I have two plats to cover. Um, The first one uh, is um, case 2319, SWIG 5959 Barkley. It's the final plat. Um, This is pretty straightforward. Um, There's no additional right-of-way dedication on here other than easements for um, stormwater for this location. It was just not platted back um, when they submitted the preliminary development plan, and so staff asked for them to plat the property officially and have it recorded. Um, There were no comments. Um, Planning Commission uh, voted um, uh, unanimously to approve the plat. And there were no conditions that were outstanding on this one. Um, do you have any questions? It's pretty straightforward. I can answer any questions you might have on this one. All right. Nope. Can I get a little presentation? Nope. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just sharing the, yeah. Um, okay, so the second one was a little bit more complicated, um, it has a little bit more backstory and background on it. It's uh, case number 2312, the Morrison Ridge final plat. This is a replat of an original plat um, that is that was um, uh, two parcels that are being divided into four for residential development of single family homes uh, by Claussen Construction. And um, when the preliminary develop, or I'm sorry, when the preliminary plat was submitted to us, um, we worked significantly with um, public works staff to determine what kind of right of way we needed, what needed to happen with tie-in for the for the stormwater. Um, we had to work with the uh, property owners to the east. There are two property owners um, that would be affected by easements for the stormwater, and they um, signed easement agreements for that stormwater access to be able to tie into the existing stormwater infrastructure there and then continue that infrastructure to the west over to the west side of the property. Um, at the time, you know, the, the the plans weren't quite all fleshed out yet. So the those two easements were all we required for the preliminary plat. Um, and then we um, recognized that the um, west side would also need another easement for tower properties where the apartments are on the west side of this, these properties, um, which I forgot to mention for the record, just um, that it's at uh, basically 53rd and Riggs um, on some undeveloped vacant land. Um, but anyway, so the properties on the west, um, Kloss and Construction worked with them to develop an easement for some riprap for the stormwater to be able to um, eject on to their property, and they were in agreement with that, signed an easement agreement for that as well. Um, we worked extensively with all the properties, um, especially the residential homeowners. You know, I talked with them, had them come into the office um, on a couple different occasions to kind of, uh, you know, let them know, have them understand what those easements were for and, and why we were doing them. Um, and it was basically just for public access. Um, those easements were never established beforehand. And so we were doing the right thing this time to establish those um, easements. So um, they, um, I don't believe that anybody actually came to the public hearing for that, for the preliminary plat. They may, they may have come to listen in, but we had basically um, worked with them enough to the, to the point where they felt comfortable um, with that public hearing and didn't have any opposition. Um, There were some conditions with that preliminary plat um, that the class and construction did fulfill for the final plat. Um, That was for the permanent drainage easement. Um, for stormwater infrastructure, there was a uh, another drainage easement. So that was for lot three and lot four. Those were two conditions. 
Um, and then the uh, they had to submit a stormwater management study, which they did, um, that showed that it would not um, detrimentally affect uh, downstream properties. And then the final plot uh, would note pr the private drive um, that's being uh, proposed with a uh, construction permitting that will need to take place before the homes can be built, that a private drive would be maintained in perpetuity uh, by the property owners of lots one through four. So those four lots. Um, that property um, maintenance agreement would be recorded with the county. Um, and um, go in perpetuity with this property. So it would be an appurtenant uh, easement management, I'm sorry, appurtenant management agreement. Um, and then a maintenance agreement for um, uh, that it would be recorded as the actual last uh, condition there. So um, this was voted again unanimously by the planning commission, but the preliminary plat and the final plat was uh, recommended for uh, approval to the city council this month, uh, in September. And if you have any questions, I can answer questions on that one too. Go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, what are they gonna build in, in terms of parking or a garage? Do they say anything about what their intentions are? So I believe the single family homes will have garages. Um, the So originally with the original plat, there was a, um, a right of way for a street called Florence Street between the uh, north two properties and the south two properties. Um, that was never built and there's no intention to build through streets in that area of town. So um, that private drive that was Florence Street indicated as Florence Street on the original plat would be a private drive now. Um, it would be um, maintained by the property owners either. We're encouraging Clawson Construction to actually establish an HOA. We can't outright uh, require it, I don't believe, but we're, we're encouraging him to uh, establish an HOA so that he would not necessarily be responsible for that and it could be sold, at, but it would go pertinent to those properties. So Florence is not going to be a street or it is going to be not a, a public street. street. It not would a be, public yeah. street. Okay. It would be a private drive, basically built okay. to city standards with a concrete um, as we would require for any private drive. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, are we going to retain ownership of that strip of land and then just the, the drive would be an easement for those? No. Properties? Yeah, it would just be an easement. Okay. So we would have the ability to construct if we needed to something, whatever it happens to be, if there's utilities that okay. need to go there. Um, the, um, yeah, on the plat itself, yeah, the, 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 where the public utilities are currently, that would be um, where we would have easements. Okay. And they yeah. would only be building homes like on the, on the lots that are written out there. So if we ever wanted to you know, renegotiate that right of way or, or build streets, that would still be, you know they wouldn't be able to like construct a permanent structure there um um who knows i don't know that it means that actually okay. yeah. yeah um if he if he constructs a private drive there and he maintains it i believe that we yeah. um give over those rights to him to be able to keep that street there okay do you know who is there's there's part of that florence street that's that's actually like a that's grass do you know who's been mowing and maintaining that all this time um, I don't know. I wonder if that's, yeah. I, 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 I guess the real question is you haven't heard anything like negative from surrounding property owners. Like I thought this was mine type of thing. No, okay. but, uh, one, one of the ladies that on the East side did, uh, construct a fence and she was concerned about that fence okay. as far as what would be done if, you know, utilities needed to be reconstructed, uh, there, um, you know, and we let her know that if something did need to happen, yes, you, I mean, that, that yeah. fence would have to come down perhaps potentially. Um, and she did still sign that easement agreement with that understanding. So, okay. Sounds good to me. Answer like number four. Quick question. Yeah. I know where the Morrison came from, because that's Morrison Ridge. Where'd Florence come from? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> we'll look into that. <laughs> yeah, it was like. <laughs> yeah, it'd be 52nd Terrace if we plotted it today. But yeah. Thanks for your work in that area. I totally appreciate it. I mean, Brent's done a lot of work. He's not here, but totally appreciate the work you've done in keeping with the neighbors because we've had a couple on the western end, Broadmoor in that area yes. that have had some issues with gradient problems and water problems and very responsive to everything they've asked. So I totally appreciate Great. it. Thank you for that. <laughs> All right.
right. Well, thank you. Thanks. Okay, our first action item this evening is the acceptance of the meeting minutes from Robin Fox. Thank you. Draft minutes of the September 6th Community Development Committee meeting are included for review and acceptance in your packet tonight. Recommend that we accept them and take them to consent agenda. Okay, next we will consider a proposal for pedestrian pedestrian improvements at 61st Street and Broadmoor Street from Laura Smith. Yes, do get me instead of Brent. I'm sorry about that. Night is parent teacher conferences and when your spouse is also a teacher, um, he had to pull a uh, double duty for that. So um, we've been talking about uh, some sort of pedestrian safety improvements at this intersection for several years particularly based on feedback. I know several of you have had conversations with Wellstone residents uh, and others. And so this was included in um, the 2023 Cap Street Capital Improvement Program to look at putting, we had uh, Olson evaluate different options and they came back with uh, the flashing uh, stop signs with the pedestrian buttons to activate those as the solution that they felt was best uh, for this intersection. Um, currently, as you know, a uh, four-way stop, um, it will be a matter of upgrading the is existing stop sign assemblies to make them flash when the buttons are pushed. Um, and then that pedestrian activation, those buttons will be included at three of the four uh, intersection um, corners and the whole system will be solar powered. So we don't need to run conduit uh, anything like that. Um, they bid the project in August, uh, opened the bids in September. We only had one bidder respond. That was Total Electric. electric. Um, we thought it could have gone one of two ways. It would either be a concre concrete contractor who bid and subbed out the electrical work or the signal um, traffic control contractor who bid and subbed out the concrete work, which is what we got with Total Electric. We're familiar with them. They do maintenance on our uh, city-owned traffic signals. Um, we included $60,000 in the 2023 CIP for this project. The bid came in at 71, as I think was referenced in the action item summary. Uh, there's approximately $11,000. Uh, in a force account, which is sort of the contingency. We don't, it's a pretty straightforward project. We don't anticipate that we would need to do that. So we expect really being able to bring that project in um, pretty close, if not at that $60,000 uh, estimate. So I will try to answer any other questions you might have, or we will, I will take copious notes and Brent can answer them in two weeks. <laughs> Yeah, I, we, I've already had this conversation with you, Laura, but for the benefit of everyone else, I, I, I think this is not necessarily a bad solution, but I think fixing this intersection probably requires something a bit more um, structural in nature. I don't, we'll, we'll see. I hope it moves the needle a little bit. Um, and I, I think the price is, is reasonable for what it is, but I'd like to see, I think, more done here, something like a, a raised crosswalks or speed table, something like that. And I think as uh, Council Member Chosey and I discussed this afternoon during agenda review, I think as we look at a final design concept for whatever improvements happen at Johnson Drive and Metcalf with KDOT, um, obviously the, those uh, have impacts in both north and south directions. And so that's probably an appropriate time um, to look at some of those other considerations potentially. I just recommend that we take this to council uh, consent. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Um, our next action item tonight will be for consideration of a project survey for the Johnson Drive Phase Two project, also from Laura Smith. Yes, thank you. So, everybody's familiar and excited about the next phase of Johnson Drive improvements, which. Um, we have uh, currently secured the $6 million STP grant for, so Lamar to Metcalf. Um, project has a big price tag all in with design, easement, right-of-way acquisition and construction. Garcia IP is showing somewhere in the neighborhood of about $14 million. So really significant project. 
uh, for our city. Um, we have that programmed in our uh, street CIP. Um, it's also programmed in the CARS uh, program for 2026. It will include full depth pavement reconstruction, sidewalk and retaining walls, stormwater improvements, traffic signal buyout, replacement of streetlights, installation of a Hawk pedestrian signal at rigs and other various streetscape improvements. Um, the stormwater and the sidewalk needs in particular will trigger the need for us to acquire um, both permanent and temporary construction easements, as well as additional right of way along a significant portion. Many of you weren't here for the first section of Johnson Drive, but um, we had strange right of way lines and there are some of those that still exist to the west of Lamar. Um, we have been in close conversation with KDOT who will be sort of overseeing and administering the STP funds. And they have provided us with a timeline uh, in which kind of the milestones we need to hit in the design and right of way acquisition process in order to meet their schedules. We have to use a KDOT approved appraiser. There's a very formal process as we go through this right of way acquisition. And so the first step is completing this survey work so that we can then turn those documents over to an appraiser who will be selected through a competitive process uh, and they can go out and then start the actual easement acquisition process. The estimated design contract for the Johnson Drive project was is plugged into the 2024 Street CIP program uh, at $950,000. Um, obviously it creates a lot of issues, both budget and on paper from an audit perspective uh, for us to, to authorize that full contract in this year. Uh, so we worked with Olson to pull out just the survey work as a separate task order, which will allow us to proceed within our budget for this year and um, keep us on track with the KDOT timeline and milestones. And so we would estimate then coming back probably in January or February of 2024 with the balance of that design contract so we could proceed with that. Um, so this is a task order that just includes survey, serv survey services for the roadway and stormwater infrastructure. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Or just a comment, I continue to hear how you know poor the condition is on that part of Johnson Drive, which we all know, I'm stating the obvious here, but I think it would be great if whether it's now or when it we're more in a heavier part of the design phase, if we could share it maybe with the Shawnee Mission Post so folks know that this is on our radar. It's a $13 million project. It takes a long time, even though 2026 is far away. I think it's an opportunity to help begin to educate the public on, on how extensive projects like this are. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, is the business community on board with this? Or are they familiar with what's coming? <laughs> <laughs> they are until they're not exactly as Emily would say. Um, I think that what we find is, and I think, you know, we have experience uh, and a lot of lessons learned, although the scope of the project and the impact of the project will be different than Lamar to Null because I mean, we were going right up to building fronts. Um, and as Emily can attest, because she was the go-to person on the street throughout the course of that project, there were oftentimes we were creating temporary entrances in the back, um, back end of businesses. So it will be um, a long process. And I think that's why we want to make sure we're really out ahead of this because sitting down and negotiating those easements is really our best, first and best opportunity to begin that conversation with the businesses about the impacts until we actually bid the construction of the project, we aren't able to communicate about things like construction timing or potential closures of you know ingress and egress points, which is obviously a significant concern. But we will have those uh, touch points, and I don't. It's been so long. It's been ten years, so it's it'll be twelve years. So I think we'll use some different communication methods, obviously. Um, but we'll we'll start that early and. I'm sure be doing that often. I get a recommendation. Yeah, I'd recommend we take this to council. I don't know if you want to do it um, regular agenda for this or or consent. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, our next action item tonight will be consideration of 2025 street preservation program pro projects in conjunction with SMP funding, also from Laura Smith. Yes, thank you. I think everyone's familiar with uh, this latest iteration of our residential street maintenance program. We've been trying to design ahead for a variety of reasons. A, if we ever have the opportunity to take advantage of cost savings in projects, which we have not yet realized, we are positioned and could be ready to go uh, if there was ever extra money. But then in the midst of all of this, the Johnson County stormwater program has sort of changed their requirements. On, on one hand, they've added the opportunity for cities to apply for reimbursement of stormwater cost maintenance costs, which was not something historically that SMAC has funded, but they put us on a two-year funding request cycle. So in order to, for us to be able to request reimbursement for stormwater associated with um, projects in 2025, we have to submit that application by the end of this year. And so again, uh, we know the streets that are currently slated for construction in 2025, you'll, you may remember that 55th Street is our one very large, significant 2024 street project. Um, but this, again, is a task order that we have sort of carved out from the larger design, which will allow us to be able to submit that application to SMAC by the end of the year. And then we will bring back uh, a design contract uh, at some point in 2024. And well, and I would I would say this is twelve thousand four hundred and sixty eight dollars paid for from the stormwater utility fund. Council Member Davis, are we getting a new revised version of the condition of the streets? I know we talked about that there was going to be new core samples or or identifying. Well, I think right now we're still operating on uh, the twenty. All right, whatever year, Brent's okay. not here. No, so we we updated. We had 2017, then we updated. And then our plan is to revise or update that every five years. So I think we're another two years out from an okay. updated PCI. But we, we really didn't see, um, I think that we talked about there were some discrepancies between 2017 and I believe 20, I think it was 2021 by the time we got the study results in overall PCI ratings. And we think that's methodology more than anything else in terms of how the samples um, for the PCI ratings were taken. Uh, but when you look at um, how streets are comparatively with those PCI rankings, it really hasn't created any sort of reshuffling of that deck. So it, it is being evaluated, but we haven't seen any major changes. The next opportunity might be in you know five years or another two years really when we update the PCI inventory. Thank you. Uh, I'd go ahead and recommend that we take this to consent. Our next action item tonight is for the replacement of the kitchen flooring at the Pell Community Center from Penn Almoni. Thank you. So the Pell Community Center's kitchen floor, specifically on the south end, was originally tile and grout, constructed in 1999. Obviously, those of you who have tile and grout in your kitchen, you know it's not very uh, consumer friendly for spills. Um, imagine that repeated over and over again for 20 plus years. So the four by four inch tiles have reached their useful life and we thank them for their service. <laughs> um, as part of the 2023 capital improvement plan, we set aside $10,000 for that replacement and keeping in mind best practices and, and uh, the industry standard, um, we consider cost effectiveness, safety, visual appeal, and then maintenance friendly options and landed on an epoxy surface. So um, four vendors were reached out to, three of whom responded and um, Big Red bid $5,050, Blastic Clean bid $6,250 and Apex opted out. Apex was the one that did our locker room epoxy flooring. Um, Big Red, all of them have done work with the City of Mission, but Big Red's done extensive projects, both large and small, and most recently completed the polished concrete flooring in room C, D, and E, has done a pretty good job. Um, 
their warranties for one year and the product warranties for seven years. So staff is recommending that we contract with Big Red Decorative Concrete for South Kitchen Tile Removal and Epoxy Installation for an amount not to exceed $5,050, which is a savings of $4,950. Pretty significant. So we were pleased about that. And these funds are available from our Parks and Recreation Sales Tax Fund. I'm happy to answer your questions. Council Member Chase. I know we spoke about this once before. How's the, you said these are the folks currently doing the polished concrete? Correct, yeah. How, does that dust control continue to be good? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's been, it's been wonderful. They actually uh, remediated most of that. I, you know, I saw it kind of peeking underneath yeah. the doorways and uh, yeah, that, that day second, it seemed like there was nothing in the air. Yeah. So that was great. Second day uh, they came through and I mean, they, they had a scrubber that actually vacuumed as it was scrubbing. So um, there was a lot of those potential issues that we completely avoided. Which was yeah. Wonderful. You know, with grinding concrete, that's always what I'm thinking about for right. For them and the and the patrons and us, yeah. Can I get a recommendation? Recommend consent. <clears throat> Our next action item tonight will be approval for the purchase of playground equipment for Mohawk Park, also from Penn, and I am super excited about this. <laughs> yeah, this is like. Uh, hopefully, you saw a rendering within the packet. But this uh, existing playground was installed in 96 uh, based off of our manufacturer info. And that was prior to the acquisition of the city. Um, it's once again served a very useful life. Back in, you may recall 2020, there were some, some elements that we needed to repair and uh, brought it up to safety standards, investment of like 16,000, I believe. And so it's still, um, it's still a safe place for children and families to, you know, engage and uh, have some interactive play. Um, but once again, they're recommended to be replaced every 20 years or so. And we've, we've missed the mark on something called um, accessibility. And so standards have changed significantly since 1996. And that's been at the forefront of all of our discussions with stakeholders, with residents, just within our department, and as well as with council members. So I appreciate your input um, and considerations and all this, but I wanted to include some of the most um, outstanding uh, elements that we were discussing. And that's making sure that we're considering the abilities and needs of all residents, no matter their age, no matter their um, um, cognitive or, or um, other disability or limitations. Um, make sure that we incorporate universal design principles, such as equitable use, flexibility in use, simple and intuitive use, um, perceptible information, tolerance for error, and low physical effort, as well as size and space for approach and use. <coughs> and we believe this rendering, as well as all of the you know, factors associated with it, meets those qualifications. Uh, the principles educated and enabled staff, as well as uh, stakeholders in the public, to make sure that we're not only meeting the standard that's in place now, but exceeding that and meeting expectations of our residents. So the existing design um, obviously doesn't meet the current all ability standard, which is why we're proposing this new higher standard in the rendering. A universally designed sensory rich playground creates an environment that enables children to develop physically, socially, and emotionally. And in these environments, there's little segregation, which I felt like is an important component that we may not consider is, is that they're able to play alongside anybody, which is wonderful, uh, whether or not they're able-bodied or um, these spaces create engaging areas that provide optimal level of challenge, plentiful access points, and help creativity thrive and abundant opportunities to succeed. Inclusive design goes beyond meeting the minimum of uh, interactive play and uh, creates a lot of variety of play. So while uh, universal design components, there's a quote here from the Idea Center, a process that enables and empowers a, a diverse population by improving human performance, health and wellness, as well as social participation. So uh, these, these play elements not only have uh, benefits to those that are actually 
using them, but as well as their caregivers, parents who are alongside making sure that they that they're enjoying it, that they're not struggling, that these caregivers have ample time to engage themselves. So as a final design of phase two, cost estimates for this inclusive play feature began at 600,000 for play features alone, not including a poured in place surface, which allows seamless access from the, the concrete into the play zone. And uh, that obviously exceeded our initial budget projections by approximately 200,000. So then we began in earnest to, uh, you know, discuss whether or not we fundraise, if there are multiple grants, if we were able to um, align for each of those grants and, and find some synergies there. So Confluence reached out to several manufacturers, including Burliner, Landscape Structure, and Game Time, who each submitted concepts. And after reviewing all of those elements that we've previously discussed, we landed on this game time rendering, which uh, we feel gives us the biggest bang and uh, most complete and comprehensive um, array of elements that engage all abilities. So um, we we discussed some of the limitations with budget and uh, Cunningham, to their credit, uh, proposed alternatives, and then um, late in the summer discussed the grant opportunity that they had that was coming up, which is why I'm before you today. These grants, unfortunately, have a limited funding period, which is why it's kind of a condensed time frame to to uh, to discuss. But it would require us to purchase the equipment by the end of October, and then store it until the project is bid and ready for construction, which we anticipate the first part of the summer. And uh, taking advantage of this funding option on the positive side would save us $216,744. So I'd be remiss if we didn't at least give the opportunity for council to weigh in. So um, keeping in mind that we've also reached out to Land and Water Conservation Fund, applied for phase two grant funding for that in an amount of $566,000. And so I believe with those two elements, uh, we'll be able to fund phase two um, to the appropriate levels without any uh, deficiencies. So staff sees value in ordering the equipment early and is recommending approval with contracts with Cunningham Recreation for inclusive playground pieces in an amount not to exceed $226,000 of $428. Sorry, $226,428. So these dollars were set aside as part of the 2024 capital improvement uh, plan, as well as the 2022A bond uh, proceeds. Installation would be estimated for summer. And uh, some of you are probably wondering, do we have the footprint to store it? Brent, to his credit, has said, you you bet, we got you covered, Penn. And so we're going to store it at Public Works Storage Yard. It's going to be packaged and wrapped not only for weather, outdoor weather protection, but as well as transport protection. So we should be good on all of those elements. I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions? I had one question or just more a thing I wanted to flag, which was um, since we're going to be storing it, and it sounds like we'll be storing it without unpacking it. Is that right? Correct. So, so in their terms and conditions, and sorry, this is kind of wonky, but they, so it says that anything about concealed damage or discrepancies and quantities has to be reported within 60 days of receipt. So I don't know if we've talked to them about that, or if they'd be willing to change that term, you know, to give us a little bit of an extension with the, as long as we report, you know, I think it gives us 15 days to report any damaging damage to the outside of the packaging. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if, as long as we comply with that part if we could get them to agree to something a little longer on yeah. the other part of the terms. just Yeah, that's a great point. And keeping in mind, this is only a portion of yeah. the, the inclusive play feature. So we still have a pretty significant chunk, uh, 173,000, if, if uh, memory serves me right, that we've got to purchase from them um, that doesn't have this, the extended lead time on, on, uh, fabrication. So there are a lot of elements and I can absolutely follow up with them and make sure that they, they amend that for us to sign. Great. Yeah. Go ahead. Do you know if any of the materials the company uses are made out of recycled product? Yes. In fact, uh, that's 
that's a big selling point for Cunningham Rec as well as Game Time. Um, it's also made in America, which is an important piece for the grant, the Land and Water Conservation Fund grant piece. And so uh, that was in there as part of our discussion. And uh, it's coming from a couple different areas, so I'll follow up with them. Thank you. You bet. When will we find out about the grant? By the way, for something. So I just met with Land and Water Conservation Fund coordinator, and uh, Riston has said that there should be a shorter turnaround because uh, you may recall that took about eight or nine months last year. So uh, some things have changed. Processes have improved, streamlined somewhat. He's hoping that we'll know by April at the latest. Um, I think he's he, the heartburn he felt in kind of sharing that information has kind of uh, migrated up the ranks to people who weren't very considerate in, in terms of the timeline. So that'll hopefully shorten. That was a 400 page grant that Penn put together. Brutal. It was very Leslie <laughs> Nope with the, in the, in the binder with yeah. the, the dividers. Yeah. It was very <laughs> impressive. I saw it. Thank you. <laughs> And I, I would just add that it does, we hadn't anticipated applying for a land and water conservation grant fund initially when we put the CIP together. So if we are successful in securing that, it certainly frees up some other dollars potentially um, to continue our work in parks. Great. Council member Chosen. Thank you, uh, Penn. I think I remember you and maybe Taylor got some training a while back for like inspecting and maintaining the mm -hmm. playground equipment. Yes. Is that, you know, if that's gonna apply to like, does that apply to everything? Or just the styles of playground equipment that we had at the time? Or? Yeah, so there, uh, it does apply to everything. Okay. There are still some features that continue to be introduced. Yeah, new to, curveballs for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so soft fall zones are always one of those elements that gets amended every two years. So yeah, as part of our recertification, we review that. But there are, uh, what was one of them? The, the in-ground trampolines, because they were so new, there were no safety standards for Taylor and I mm. to actually measure. And so um, the best we could do was like uh, drop a ball for, you know, the, the pressure density test and check for gaps around the edges. And to that end, we've kind of shied away from including that in our playgrounds. Okay. So that there's some yeah. body of knowledge before we jump into the, that realm. Cool. Yeah. So it's great to hear that there's, you're on top of that and they yeah. keep updating you with that. Yeah, thanks. Council Member Davis. There are no other questions. I recommend that we take this to non-consent. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, Council Member Thomas just has to say. Well, I will share. Penelope was in the back office earlier this week and the big poster is back there. And she's like, I want to play on that. I want to play on that. I want to pointing it out. So I think kids are going to be very excited. Good job, Pen. Thank you. I, I want to play on them too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very excited. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Um, our final action item tonight is consideration of purchase of adult lounge furniture for the Pell Community Center, also from Penn. Thank you. So during the 2020 COVID-19 uh, restrictions, staff closed the Pell Community Center adult lounge. Um, soon thereafter, restrictions were lifted somewhat. We needed the ability to space out our equipment. We heard from American Stroke Foundation in particular, whose access points were restricted. And so we, we transitioned that space to a modified fitness space. Since then, we've got resounding feedback from individuals who were previously unable to access any of our fitness equipment. And so uh, we're proposing keeping that as a, as a modified fitness space. Um, in January 2022, we met with pros as part of the feasibility study and began in earnest discussing each room the users, the, the long-term, short-term impacts and intent behind its use. And so that's weighed into some of our considerations. But uh, since then, we've had anywhere between 15 and 20 unique individuals who've approached our team and or some of you or some um, administrative staff and inquired about a lounge at the community center what it would look like, where it'd be located, inclusions, stuff like that. Um, 
And the idea would to be have a an area for them to sit down, wait, maybe finish their workout, wait for a, a spouse or loved one, an area where people can just relax while they're waiting for the child to get a swim lesson finished. Um, while reviewing the current configuration, staff identified a potential location that makes better use of the existing area next to the south entry desk. And it creates a pleasant and functional workspace just outside the indoor pool and auditorium. And um, it's got a viewing ability from a seated position. And that space is the current vending area. So some of you have probably seen the renderings of, of what uh, that space would look like. The proposal is to convert the vending space into a functional lounge with the charging ports along a bar height table or a standard height table. So that rendering doesn't have to be just bar height. The, this would activate an otherwise underutilized space and keep patrons close to the south exit, which uh, we found it was a need. You know, if we send two people too far up the hallway, um, they find a seat and then, you know, they're looking for a staff member to ask them maybe a follow up question and it takes them a while to get back to a desk or or find a, a roving staff member. <laughs> this would uh, this would also allow the communities of all ages standard to be in place by having it nice and centralized to a, a major access point. Um, it also is close to our entry desk staff for their um, in detailed questions or needs. It's also an ideal nook just on the opposite side of where we anticipate putting a coffee table, um, which would be housed kind of that, it's a, it's a pony wall where there's a magazine rack right now, but we anticipate that being a coffee table. Staff would then move the vending machines to the north lobby to allow open seating per, per the uh, rendering that you've looked at. So this area could comfortably seat 10 individuals, which is roughly about 10% of our active membership. And that's kind of a, a industry standard for lounge spaces. When they're bigger than that, obviously uh, they, they anticipate having a larger membership. Um, um, of the of the community. So areas like these are designed to be congregation spaces and short-term meeting points for patrons to move to the next activity. And uh, staff has experienced the downside of a larger space like we had previously, and that becomes a little bit loud, somewhat ruckus. Uh, raucous. Uh, people don't feel comfortable walking in there if there's, you know, a comfortable kind of group of people. Um, we've even had people uh, just outwardly say, you're not allowed in this space, which is kind of counter to the, the feeling that we want to generate um, at a community center, you know. So um, with these considerations in mind, staff has secured bids from two commercial furniture providers. Scott Rice Office Works submitted the most thorough and comprehensive bid for $9,539.62, which includes installation. The other one did not include installation. So uh, staff is recommending that the project be awarded to Scott Rice Office Works for adult furniture procurement and installation for that amount, $9,539.62 which is a savings based of our initial estimates of $5,460.38. And this would include a 12 year warranty and seating, which could potentially hold up to a 300 pound individual, you know, it's commercial density. So uh, there's an eight week lead time, which lands us right about the last two weeks of December for an anticipated installation date. Uh, the funds were part of the 2023 capital improvement plan. And we, um, have those in place because of the parks and recreation sales tax. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Go ahead. I'll go with you. Good. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Penn. I'm really happy to see kind of the new vision for what this lounge will look like. I, I think you're definitely on the right track. I, I just had a couple questions kind of related to all this. Um, are we planning on putting any kind of like artwork or some sort of visual element up in that space? It seems like it might be a little cramped and dull as is and just wondered if there was any sort of way to brighten that or absolutely in fact if if you remember any of the rooms we've changed artwork recently as part of that maintenance shutdown okay. so that's that's an ongoing uh, goal of ours to uh, activate each of the space artistically and make sure that there's a little bit of revised artwork throughout we've even discussed putting a tv in that area potentially um 
you know, using it as a small um, area to present or, you know, check sports or whatever. Um, okay. yeah. And then we're not planning on doing the free coffee anymore as part of this lounge, correct? We were planning on doing some free coffee, not to the extent. So you may recall we had coffee available in the lounge all day long, as long as from opening to night. Um, it became a pretty large customer service sticking point for us. Mm -hmm. We couldn't keep up with demand, spills everywhere throughout the facility. And so part of our initial discussions were to limit that to just the morning hours and um, bring it back to uh, the limited extent. So that I guess I, I kind of have a, an overall thing that I've been thinking about related to this too. And I I still think that we're missing an opportunity by not having some sort of concession element for sale mm -hmm. at the community center. I mean, especially if we're getting all this demand for coffee and like we're the ones furnishing it every day, it just seems like we could maybe have an easy layup to be able to have some sort of like coffee for sale element or some sort of, you know, concession piece we could sell, especially if we're going to have kind of folks hanging out in this lounge area. So is there any way we could still try to consider some sort of like, you know, commerce element related to concessions to be able to serve patrons? It seems like that's just something that is missing in my opinion. Yeah. I'm an idea guy. So I love any and all ideas and I'm happy to, uh, to discuss, you know, locations and feasibility in my experience, concession areas have, have runs on them. And so it's really short periods of time where they're activated. And so the difficulty then is aligning either your fitness programming in conjunction with that, whoever is working that space mm -hmm. perfectly. Um, and then the downtime in between when either of those programs or fitness classes aren't. And so we run into a similar model to the child watch where it it's a run on the bank for about an hour and a half. And then it's relatively uh, slow ghost town esque the rest of the day. So uh, yeah, but I'm happy. What I love about the concession idea is that it's new, it's, re it's fresh. It creates a, a specific purpose within an area. Um, so okay. yeah, I'm happy to discuss that. Well, I mean, I obviously defer to you on what you think is best. It just seems like based on the discussions and all those focus groups meeting and stuff, that might be an area to continue to generate some revenue. Yeah. Um, and then I guess I also just had a request if we could keep the free coffee thing on a short leash to see how it works for the first few months. I just, it really, I, I just get really hung up that like we're still doing that when we could be charging for that and potentially continuing to chip away at some of the cost recovery at the community center. So, yeah. Um, but I do like the vision and I think it's, I commend your team for kind of putting this forward. So just wanted to get that out there. Thank you. I had a question as well, um, cause I remember the old lounge, um, and people seem to really enjoy it. And it seemed like a lot of people, older people would just sit in there and hang out. It was kind of like their little community spot. This doesn't look like a same type of thing. Correct. You know, all of the chairs are facing one way or there's two tables are you trying to kind of avoid the good old boys club yes. atmosphere or? absolutely because that that was the that was the uh, uh for lack of a better term anti-community piece okay right if you were part of the group you loved the community center if you weren't part of the group it was really uh you felt ostracized and okay. there was a lot of people not part of the group and so the idea is why are we creating something we know can do harm why don't we limit that harm as much as possible and create a space for that purpose, which is let's let's have people meet up. This is a great location to hang out for 10, 15 minutes and then move to a place where then you can move towards that kind of, you know, the comfortable mm -hmm. hangout. Yeah. Okay. I just, I just wondered if we were, what your thoughts were. So thank you for clarifying. You, you bet. I have a question on behalf of the short people, which I guess would also maybe count as a communities for all ages question, um, which is that it concerns me a little bit that in the design that eight of the 10 seats are high tops. You mm -hmm. know, if you're thinking about our users of the community mm -hmm. center and um, both youth and um, more elderly people, as well as people like me who are just short, um, if we can maybe consider at least bringing 
the other separate table that's labeled as bar height down to seated height or potentially, you know, all of the seating. Um, I just don't think having eight high tops is very inviting for most of the users of the community center. Yeah, that's a fair point. And uh, this was a rendering. I know you said there were options, but yeah. I just wanted to flag that as we're working. I think, I think that's great. As long as we have an option and you're probably right, we should have more shorter seating than higher seating. Oh. So I agree with that. We'll get we'll get a revised rendering. Anyone else? Go ahead. I can't believe I'm going to comment on coffee, but I am going to comment on coffee only because I've been bugging you about it since 2020. So I'm excited to hear that free coffee is coming back. Sorry, Trent. Um, I think it's the little things that people really enjoy. I'd love to see if have towels for people, but I do love the idea of concessions, maybe just back behind the main desk. Maybe it's like a clear fridge with Gatorades or something. Mm. I just... I'm excited about the space, but agree with Solly's comments about the chairs. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? All right. Can I get a recommendation? I recommend that we take this to council on consent. Fantastic. And round of applause for them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, Ms. Smith, are there any department updates for the Community Development Committee? Okay. You already said that. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> So uh, some of you are really excited about this. I got a couple of emails today, but uh, we broke ground on Broadmoor Perimeter Trail. Yeah, the eastern edge is where we'll begin. And we will work counterclockwise, phased uh, construction to allow access to the park as much as possible for those that utilize it for their um, health and wellness objectives. So really excited about that. Uh, get that in motion. Um, we painted the, the seating along the west edge of Mohawk Park that kind of looks out into the field. Um, I know a couple of you had brought that up, but um, that's the first step in making sure that we're hitting our, our mark on the safety element so that people notice that there's a 18 inch drop from there. And uh, the concrete polished, polished concrete floor has been finished is in place, so swing by when you get an opportunity. It drastically changes the space, um, I believe, in the positive. The echo is not as bad as I had thought it was going to be. You can notice it um, as soon as you get in there, but it's not as bad as I thought. Um, looks really good. They've done great work. They still need to touch up a few areas that where the polish didn't go deep enough, but uh, we've been pleased with their work. Just a note, maintenance note, the Rock Creek Trail behind the uh, county office buildings there. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. That one tree that has like, I don't know what, the bean pods almost. It's yeah. just carpeted the trail with the bean pods. Okay. It's, it's slippery and it kind of smells bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought I'd well, let you know since I just rode over there like three hours ago. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for walking the trail too. Oh, no, we're on there, uh, on there just about every day. Oh. Great. Well, uh, oh, you'll be happy to know that we're planning five trees along Rock Creek Trail, mostly along the western edge, where it's, it's just a lot of turf. So oh, we yeah. want to we want to kind of create shade over on that edge. Awesome. But without the bean pods? Yeah. Without bean pods. Are we planting, but it is a city wellness activity where yeah. employees can volunteer to help plant the trees. Yeah. Awesome. It's great. And I noticed, <laughs> I also noticed those chairs were color matched to the city logo. Yeah. The Pretty impressive, coffee right? Area. Not coffee area, sorry. <laughs> I also wanted to say that uh, I took my dog to uh, Mohawk Park this past weekend, and something I didn't notice when we did the river ri ribbon cutting was the outdoor sink. It was so mm, great. I yeah. could, you know, do my duty of picking up a certain thing and then go wash my hands. Yeah. Um, so that I thought was a brilliant idea to have those on the outside of the restrooms. Thank you. It's great feedback. Yep. Thanks. Hello, I have three quick things. Um, I wanted to provide in Brent's absence a street program update, in particular Fox Ridge Drive. Um, I know that um, there was a social media post last week that celebrated the asphalt going down, which was obviously the main thing, making that surface more drivable after the difficulty of the demolition of the road previous. Um, 
they're getting close. Obviously, I don't know how, who has been on it or close by it. So I just so you know, okay, where we're where we're thinking. So right now they're working on the under drain, which is the drain system behind the curb, um, to help with the water area issues that we've had there, um, as well as the drive approaches. Um, so there's and the street lights. So that'll be the next couple of uh, weeks worth of work, and those are activities that would damage the final surface. So they leave it the asphalt surface down two inches, and then once every of the bit of the dirty work and hard work, they'll come in and do the last two. Um, so that's where the main work is. We're waiting for the signal at the Lamar intersection to uh, arrive and then be installed. That intersection will be a two inch mill and overlay, which we will do if there's time, if it's timely and the temperatures cooperate, but we will wait until after winter if we miss that mark in terms of temperature. Um, they'll also be working on sidewalks for the next two weeks. So we're still not out of the woods. It's greatly improved and they're doing the, you know, the traffic direction is still flowing the way that it was, but they'll move it as they need to, depending on the side of the street that they're working on. So we'll do a refreshed communication for people. It's just a lot of fatigue for the length of the project, but I think we just need to update that we're in the home stretch, but we're still working on these elements and then educate people about what we're actually can still completing there and what they can expect to see. The rest of the street pro, um, pro, uh, program, 61st Terrace, we think Wednesday will be paving. Um, right now they're working on just well, curing the curb, curb and driveway approaches um, and some storm box tops. So there's probably going to be minimal work that you'd see there until they do the paving. Um, and then everywhere else, you know, as we'll do sod and restoration, um, I believe he's told me mid-October, but we wait until the very end for that. But otherwise those other streets are complete. So just wanted to pass that along. I should have done it in different order. I wanted to brag on Penn. Um, he hosted a group organized from the Mid-America Regional Council and the Communities for All Ages program. Um, we have, as I've told you before, have joint cities who are participating in that program, have staff people who share ideas back and forth. And we had a group that was hosted at our park in Roland Park and then Mohawk Park in our fair city. And Kathy boyer Chessel, of course, coordinated that. Um, she's a mission resident and a little biased maybe, but not a lot biased. And she was at Sustainability Commission on Monday and just raved about Penn's um, ability to highlight the park and, and showcase mission. And so I just wanted to brag on him and thank him for doing that work uh, for us regionally. Um, and then I wanted to share, I can't remember if we've even mentioned this before, but we have the idea of doing a um, downtown mission window decorating contest for the holiday season. It's one of the um, efforts that we wanted to propose as kind of a panel of options in terms of our business support um, as we try to um, sort of support those efforts and outreach. So we launched the program today and we got immediate signups, which I'm very excited about. So the if you know of a creative person who might like to decorate a window, we're doing a little bit of matchmaking. So if someone wants to participate, but they don't feel they have that creative flair, um, we'll pair them with someone. So we'll take anyone um, high school age or older who would like to decorate a window. So please send them my way or share this information with anyone. Um, but then also talk it up with the businesses that you know. We've heard really good response. And so far, most of the businesses are going to be decorating their own window. We'll have them decorated by the Small Business Saturday after Thanksgiving, the 25th of November, and the contest would be up through the end of the year. Uh, we'd have paper ballots and electronic voting that we'd highlight during holiday lights and festive sites, et cetera. So I'm really encouraged by the initial reception that we're getting and people seem appreciative of the business community down there. And I'm really excited to see the displays. So right now there's a form on the front page of our website. It's just really, really brief. We just need to know if you're a business that wants to participate or if you're an artist or a creative that wants to participate. So if you could share that word, we'll do a social post yes to, uh, tomorrow. Um, I sent an email out today. Um, and then just on the, on the tail of that, all, obviously holiday lights and festive sites will be the first Friday of December, like it has been, which is December 1st, um, beginning at 6 p.m. to 7.30. Um, and then the downtown businesses will be doing their sip and stroll again the next Saturday. So usually they've done it in November, but now they're doing it the first Saturday in, in December. So it'll be a nice one, two, Kind of coordinated effort and we've shared that information with the chamber and we're and we're highlighting all three in conjunction so i think it will be a nice push and we'll have new banners up and our lights up and it should be a nice season so yeah um just two things i think the window display thing is just so fun and awesome it's such a great idea mm -hmm. i just had a quick comment 
um, I'd love for us to be able to be as inclusive around the holidays as possible and yeah. encouraging at least maybe one store to consider having like Hanukkah decorations mm-hmm. or something. So not everything is, you know, Christmas. Yeah. I've Fantastic. called it a window decorating contest thus far. So, um, we were even joking about doing like a mission market window, you know, with like snow, but I agree. Yeah. I think we can totally plant that seed and get that shared out. So, but I think so far it is like a window shopping sure lights, whatever you want. So I think we could get really out there kind of stuff. I have not that. Well, yeah, just, just a a thought for inclusion. (laughs) Um, and then my other thought, um, is, and perhaps other folks on council got a, a call from a frustrated, uh, resident at the falls earlier today. Um, very frustrated with, uh, the situation on Fox Ridge, which I already shared with staff. Um, but I'm just wondering if we could, maybe, I mean, a lot of that we can't fix, but I'm just wondering if we could maybe encourage the construction crews to allow cars to move more regularly. It sounds like there's sometimes queue hold times Mm -hmm. of 15 to 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. So people trying to leave and get to work and unable to leave their residence. And so just wondering if we could maybe communicate that we've had that concern with construction crews. Yeah. It's very difficult in that, but we'll, we'll check. We'll make sure they're doing at least what they can. Thank you. And I just want to add, so Emily talked about the underdrain system going in. So you'll remember that Fox Ridge didn't have stormwater structures and functioning stormwater, which was a big component of this project. So, and we've had some pretty significant rain events um, this summer, which are testing the limits of that. So they're not connected yet. So they're not, they are coming and they will be connected, but we we aren't to that point yet. Um, and that's that's difficult to see and understand. And we did have to use, you may recall that we were unsure about sort of the stability of the subsurface and they have had to use GeoGrid the entire length of that project as I understand it. So that's, we, we found a lot of the things that we at least planned for and anticipated, which was good. And I think that is all the updates we have this evening. Okay. <clears throat> It is now 7.52 p.m. And with no further discussion, that concludes the meeting of the Community Development Committee. Again, this video will be made public on our website at missionks.org. Thank you. All right. And it is now 7.53 p.m. And I'd like to call this meeting of the Finance and Administration Committee to order. While this meeting is being held in person, we are also offering the option for the public to participate through Zoom if preferred. Instructions on how to attend virtually are included in the City Council calendar item listed on the front page of missionks.org. The public is also invited to participate in the meeting. If you are participating through Zoom, please either add your comment in the chat feature and it will be read out loud or note that you would like to speak and we will call on you shortly to make your comment verbally. Please remember your comments or questions are visible to everyone in the meeting. If you are a part of our in-person group tonight, please raise your hand, but stay seated, and we will call on you to go to the lectern to make your comment. When you make your comment, please state your name and city of residence for the record. Also be conscientious of others trying to speak and speak slowly and clearly. This meeting will be recorded and posted on the city's website at missionks.org. Please contact the administration offices at 913-676-8350 with any questions or concerns. Ms. Folks, please call the roll. Thomas? Here. Bolting House? Here. Loudon? I think she just went to the bathroom. Ryard? Here. Ring? Here. Inman? She's online. She's online. Okay. Josie? Here. Davis? Here. All right. And our first item of business is public comment. Is there any member of the public who would like to comment now? We have um, no public presentations this evening. Therefore, we will now proceed with our regular agenda. Our first action item this evening is the acceptance of the meeting minutes from Robin Folks. Thank you. Draft minutes of the September 6th Finance and Administration Committee meeting are included for review and acceptance in your packet tonight. Okay. Recommend that we accept them consent. All right. And our second action item is consideration of a tax abatement request for the 58th Null Project from Laura Smith. Thank you. And you're probably going to hear the least from me. I know um, Mr. Heaven has a deadline. So I don't know. I think um, Mr. Kimmel, who's here with us, and Mr. Wempe um, kind of can handle, I think, most of where our conversation may center this evening. But you only probably have 
five minutes for Mr. <laughs> Heaven if uh, if we have any questions, but I'll kind of talk about timeline. I didn't think we'd talk about chairs and coffee as long as we did, so I miscalculated that. My apologies. Um, uh, I, I don't have any updated packet materials. We do have, uh, Bruce has prepared kind of a PowerPoint. Um, we were able to sort of track down the information that we were discussing during the work session, <clears throat> excuse me, about taxes. So we could illustrate for you kind of the difference of what we're receiving in tax taxes now, what we anticipate would be um, this, what the city would receive uh, with some uh, sliding scale of different abatement percentages. And so we'll kind of cover those and try to answer any questions come back and uh, revisit um, the recommendation for an abatement, um, the abatement percentage overall, and then talk a little bit about timing. We were on track um, to call a public hearing for your legislative meeting on the 18th of October, which we would still anticipate doing. You um, do not have to take action if we're not ready to take action on um, the actual request, uh, I think Mr. Wimpy has suggested that we would continue that public hearing uh, to um, another date in, in the future. And we'll talk again about that, that schedule. I would anticipate, I think we're close on the other documents that we would circulate for you and we could have those out in advance of a packet um, next Friday. So you would have an, some additional time to, uh, to review those. Again, they're pretty straightforward. Um, not pages and pages and pages of a redevelopment agreement like we've seen in some other instances with TIF. So with that, I think I might let Ms. Do you have anything you want to, are you just here to answer a question? Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think, <laughs> I don't think he's got um, a presentation. So we'll uh, let you kind of um, share a PowerPoint. You've got it on the screen. And then I've also got some handouts, which I'll Great. Well, thanks, committee members. Bruce Kimmel with Ellers. It's nice to be with you in person. It's been a little while. Um, as Laura mentioned, I just pulled together a few calculations of taxes with and without the um, potential abatement to give you a sense of how uh, city taxes play into the overall picture and in how different levels of abatement might play out. So please stop me along the way if you have questions, um, but I'll start with the first slide. Yeah. So the first column uh, or the middle column rather of the, the first slide um, is a calculation of the taxes that this parcel will be paying this coming fiscal year. So 23 for fiscal 24. Um, Johnson County has appraised a, a value of $1,530,000. It is currently classified as commercial industrial property, so that has a 25% classification rate, and therefore the assessed value of the parcel is currently about $382,000. Um, the city's mill rate for the coming year, as you know, is 18.5 mills. If you do the math with dividing it by a thousand that works out to be 1.85 percent and so the taxes that the city will collect from this parcel next year are just over seven thousand dollars also because there is no abatement in place for this coming year you would receive a hundred percent of that and again so that's seven thousand dollars after development, um, this is just an estimate, but we think it would be fair to assume that the, the property might have a value of $19 million. Actually, the developer is estimating that that final valuation might be a little bit more than that. It could be a little bit less, but $19 million seems to be about right. Um, it will be residential property at that point, so that has a different classification rate of 11.5%. So the assessed value will be about $2.2 .2 million. If you assume that the city's mill rate would be the same at that point in time, you can see that the total taxes um, that could be generated without any abatement would be about $40,000. Then if you did a, a, a approve a 70% abatement, and that's an if uh, we know, uh, you would retain 30% of that or about $12,000. So the point of this slide is that even with the abatement, you would be seeing a net gain of about $5,000 per year. And that's just for property taxes. That doesn't uh, um, look at any of the new sales taxes that would be generated from having residents 
in this part of mission, nor does it um, include any upfront fee that you would collect from the issuance of the industrial revenue bonds. So this is just looking at apples to apples, current property taxes to future property taxes. Any I'm, questions about that? Or I Laura? might add there that um, currently there is approximately $5,700 annually in stormwater utility fees that are generated or were generated. I would imagine um, we'll recalculate that uh, once developed, but I would imagine that the amount of impervious surface would remain relatively the same. And so those those would still continue to be paid to the city would not be included as part of the abatement. Great. So a number of things that would be add-ons um, to the city's benefit. But keeping the focus for now on property taxes, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, what I've done here is just a projection of what those city taxes might be over a 12-year period. Um, you can see that in year one, we have the $12,000 that I explained on the previous slide. And then this is obviously an estimate, but I think it's fair to assume that through a combination of increased valuations on the property as it goes forward and or mill rate increases to some extent, there's probably um, a fair assumption that between the two of those, these taxes could go up by about 3% per year. It might be more than that. It could be a little bit less, but three seems to be a pretty reasonably conservative assumption. And so you can see if we did inflate taxes by 3% per year, the city's retained taxes, again, assuming a 70% abatement would increase from about 12,000 up to about 16,000 over the course of the proposed abatement. And then once that abatement is done, right, you would get all of the city taxes based on the full mill rate and with that level of inflation, you'd be looking in the mid 50s. So we're assuming about 40,000 at the outset of total taxes without any abatement. But then with this abatement and with it decertifying, you can see how the taxes would be about 50 some thousand per year. And then finally, on the on the last slide, um, I know we had some discussion at the last meeting and we'll have some discussion tonight about different levels of abatement. Um, as you know, uh, it was our recommendation that you start your consideration with a 70% abatement uh, with 30% going to the city. What I've done here is just show you in the upper box, the total taxes. Um, so for all jurisdictions, and then the bottom box is again, focusing on mission taxes. But you can see with no abatement, the taxes would be about a quarter million dollars per year. And then if you did a 70% abatement, the applicants would be paying about $74,000 per year in taxes, um, net taxes, if you will, uh, or pilot as it's sometimes referred to. And obviously with a lower abatement percentage, they'd be paying more. So you can see how that escalates up if you were from the bottom of the, of the table upwards. Looking at the mission specific table, um, again, you saw that $40,000 number on the first slide. So that's with no abatement. Um, you, you saw the $12,000 with a 70% abatement. And you can see that increasing or decreasing the abatement levels doesn't really bring a whole lot more to the city coffers. I mean, I don't wanna be cavalier, but it's you know $1,000, $2,000. Um, and that's really because your mill rate is pretty low and that's a good thing for the, the taxpayers of the city. Um, right now, or proposed for this next fiscal year, your mill rate is about 16% of the overall total mill rate that would be applicable to this property. So you can see you're about $40,000 $40, out of a quarter million. Um, and I just thought it might be helpful and in, in, in illustrative to give those uh, estimates with different abatement. Any questions about that before I turn it back over to Laura and or others? Okay. Thank you for providing this. It's really helpful. Great. And I would kick it right back to you, Mr. Kimmel, to just continue a little bit to talk. I know, and we'll talk sort of around uh, most of our conversation at the work session was centered around the um, recommended percentages that we had proposed based on the different uh, cri criteria in the new tax abatement policy. 
One of those, I think, where we had probably the longest discussion was around the percentage assigned to um, the attainable housing credit. Uh, and so I had just asked uh, Mr. Kimmel if he might just talk a little bit about um, about that and potentially feasibility of um, trying to increase that from the 10 percent, which has been part of the conversations um, up to this point. Great. Thank you. Uh, so we took a look at 10% versus 20%, which was the focus of some conversation. And a couple of things that I just wanted to mention is that um, mandating or, or strongly uh, encouraging 20% at this point of, of the development process would probably require some pretty serious reworking of their financial plan for this project, including their financing with the, the banks involved. Um, that would be one consideration, and I, I think it's 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 a significant one in terms of changing the number of units from eight, in this case, affordable up to 16, even though it doesn't seem like a lot for a 77 unit project, that is a pretty significant change. In addition, I would expect that if you did strongly encourage um, this level of attainable housing, the applicant very likely would ask for a higher level of abatement than the 70% then that we're currently looking at. Um, and, and, and you can tell that the, the numbers, even with a higher percentage, even though we didn't show higher percentages, um, may not be enough to really make up the difference between an attainable rent and a market rate rent. So while it's certainly something that you can um, ask at any point, this is an open negotiation and an open discussion. I felt that after looking at everything, it seemed appropriate to um, stay the course with the 10% on this project in the interest of moving forward as quickly as possible. And given the, the fact that there probably would be some upheaval with their financing plan, as well as the abatement request, if there were to be a much stronger um, push for a higher number of units for this project. Really wanna stress that this is our analysis for this project. It doesn't mean that you couldn't look for different levels of affordability on different projects. And then finally, I think uh, in your memo for the work session, you talked a little bit about um, the need, sort of that but for the need for incentives to get the developer to a market market rate. And I know you did some analysis at some varying percentages. Right. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so you might recall that um, <clears throat> there, well, from other discussions as well, there's different level, different forms of rate of return uh, calculations. There's cash on cash, there's internal rate of return, there's other forms of uh, return on investment percentages. And we can geek out over that all night um, if you would like to. But um, in the memo that I presented, I indicated that we're really seeing a lot of developers of this type of multifamily looking for a 10 to 12% cash on cash return. In
18. And um, if you're not ready at that point to to make the decision, I mean, really, the decision is going to come down to, are, you know, do you, are you willing to grant the abatement and at what level? Um, and once you sort of give us that direction, we can plug in all of the remaining holes in a performance agreement and a resolution of intent and share those documents um, kind of back with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm struggling because to some degree, the question of whether to abate, recommend abatement or not, is separate from the level and, and, and the percentages that we determined were based on what was the value to the city. Right. I mean, that was really when we redid the policy, the, the policy was what is the city getting in return for this abatement in essence? And that's what I'm struggling with, because one is a yes, no. Do we want to provide abatements to uh, such projects? And the other one is what's the level that justifies it, not on the basis of what the project's feasibility is, but what's the benefit to the city? I don't think they're separate questions. I think it's an interrelated question. So um, we, I mean, we put the parameters on the policy. I think by adoption of the policy overall and creating the baseline and establishing the minimum criteria. And, you know, as long as, as a project um, met those minimum criteria, and through Mr. Kimmel's initial analysis, it was determined that there was a need for, from a market rate of return perspective, that's sort of the first hurdle. So in order to even have us bring forward any recommendation for a specific abatement percentage, um, but any application for an IRB would have to clear that hurdle. And then once it, that was established, um, it would seem to be that, I mean, with a, adoption of a policy, to me, that communicates the, the city's willingness to entertain that and engage in that conversation with a developer. And then to really, as you dig into the information in a cost benefit analysis and some of the other things that we've shown here in terms of um, what does the developer want to invest um, in order to meet the objectives that were laid out, whether that was sustainability or affordability, attainability, um, target area. Um, but the but the council could also had the discretion to make any of those additional criteria mandatory for any particular project. Um, and so I think that's that's where I feel like we're sitting today. We've cleared that hurdle based on the analysis of the project as a demonstrated need. The likelihood that this project would move forward without the use of incentives from the city is essentially, it, it would not move forward. So the council then can look at the additional information and say, is there enough other return on our investment mm -hmm. to incentivize that? Um, and then at, at, that's kind of where we're playing with these percentages in terms of uh, in terms of the numbers. So I don't know if there's if there are other specific things we can try to answer to help resolve some of that conflict or confusion. I it's probably the best team here other than me to answer that. So very kind. Well, I think to the the staff recommendation to entertain it kind of goes to your first question, can I think because that's the meeting the but for cause and then having the positive ratio on the um, cost benefit analysis, right? And so that's kind of what's answering that question one. And then question two is sort of the percentage applying the policy. Is that right? You know, and very clearly, I think the policy was written to, to communicate to the development community that the council did not want to entertain a request for 100% abatement. That in addition to anything that might be demonstrated in the cost benefit analysis, there needed to be uh, some payment in lieu of taxes or something that was coming back more immediately to the city. And so I think that's what, that's as we were waiting for kind of the separating out the tax bills and being able to really clearly communicate to you, here's what we're generating today. 
if you go back to, you know, Mr. Kimmel's slide, I mean, I think this was pretty clear, but um, if no development happens there, um, you know, we're look how, how many more years are we looking at revenues of just $7,000 in property taxes from that, you know, from those parcels? Really? Go ahead. Um, I, I know this isn't reflected anywhere in these, in these numbers, but I'm wondering if the city has any sort of calculation that we've ever used before that maybe staff just has on just per person cost of service as a resident of mission. I'm curious, as I think about over 10 years, you know, revenues of $120,000 versus, you know, over $400,000, um, you know, abatement versus no abatement. I'm, I'm just curious with, I can't remember exactly how many folks with this project are, you know, going to be new residents based on, I can't remember, I apologize, yeah, but. I mean, I think estimated, uh, the cost benefit analysis estimated about 143. So. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just, I'm curious, you know, what for a hundred, for one out of 143 new, new mission residents, what is the cost of that person to just exist in mission? I don't know if that's something we, that yeah, exists. Don't, that's it, not something we've calculated. But a county average is included in the cost benefit analysis. I can't remember what page it was, but the average cost of services or an estimated cost of services per resident is in that cost benefit analysis. But for, for the, for the county, like as a yeah. county resident, yeah. but not for just like missions. Yeah. I don't think there's that micro level. Sure. But. Okay. Thank you. Do you have anybody? I have. Okay. Yeah. Then, you know, we've talked about a lot of analytical data and a lot of activity. I would like to get back to a basic so I have a better understanding right now based on what's considered affordable. Could I find out what a one and a two bedroom apartment is on the affordable level per month, please? Great question. Have you come up to the lectern? Yeah, just so it's well. Be, yep. Good evening, Chris Klein with Hush Blackwell. So we we have that information. We'll have to have a minute to to look that up. Uh, but I, I do want to stress that it will depend on the different unit mix. So our ten percent affordable units are spread out between the one bedroom, two bedroom, uh, and studio. So each one of those will have a different one, and we'll be able to get you that information. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to pull it up tonight. If not, we'll have that to you in between this meeting and your next one. So Thank you'll have you. that. I appreciate it, Mr. Kimmel. Do you have that? Okay. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Do we, I mean, what are, what are the costs of, of the apartments in general, just starting point for the studio one bedroom? I think that's what they're saying there. They don't, they don't want to give you a number without looking at their, um, okay. without looking at their pro forma or their spreadsheet. So we'll see if we can find that. And I guess. Um, and just in general, how does that work? I mean, how do people who need attainable housing figure out that there's some available there and then rent in general? I it would imagine that the city would be able to sort of promote those opportunities that exist within the community. Uh, I would imagine that um, because the developer is going to have an obligation to achieve <laughs> that level and maintain it for the the 10 years, I would imagine that their leasing staff would be um, very well versed in, um, you know, making sure that they had those units filled uh, kind of appropriately. And there'll be um, more specific language in a performance agreement, similar to what was included in the residence on Rock Creek or Mission Bowl project, kind of talks a little bit more about the mechanic, but I think it would, it, it's on both entities to be able to sort of promote that. Yep. I was just going to say this is very ad hoc, but I know with the residences on Rock Creek, I was talking with my friend who works for the county and some of those support service areas about the attainable units. And she was planning to like, you know, put that in her book of information and have that available for folks. So I think if we can communicate, communicate out to the county, that's who a lot of people contact for that attainable, affordable housing, and they can then also share that out. Do you have any other? Yep. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I'm, you know, I'm 
anxious to get kind of final versions of the updated staff uh, percentages and, you know, updated, um, you know, total property tax estimations for after. I'm, I'm excited to get all that, the final version so we can be prepared for the 18th. Um, you know, I think to Ken's point, I think what maybe for me still feels like I'm missing a little bit on the environmental piece is, you know, what does one globe mean? What is, you know, what is that? You know, I mean, I know that that's a certification, but I, you know, what, what is the building going to be in mission and, and what value, you know, to Ken's point, does it bring to the city? Um, so getting some clarity on that, but, um, you know, overall, I'm, I'm happy to see that there's, you know, a general net positive for the city, but I, you know, it is a, a new conversation for all of us. So I've been trying to figure out exactly what I want to say and how I want to say it, but um, at the, at the basics, the question of tax abatement is how you know how much money are we willing to forego to have this project go forward, um, and you know is the developer going to meet us there with whatever number we decide on? Um, I mean, I'm looking at you know asking the community, all the taxing entities, right, affected to to chip in. 173,000 maybe dollars of taxes over the course of the abatement is what it looks like to me, which is a little less than 1% of the, the predicted assessed value, appraised value. Um, and for our share, maybe 28,000 and change. And, and so like Bruce said, the differences between these levels are um, start to get pretty fuzzy to me. So I think it's more, you know, we, we've established the policies that we want to see, uh, you know, the, the rates and, and the things we're willing to increase the, the abatement amount for in our policy. Um, so I, I think I'm more concerned with making sure that we've figured out what those mean. And, and like you said, what is it? What is a globe? What is a lead certified? You know, what, how does that affect what number we want to put on it? Um, and in general, I, I think Laura has a good point that because of the differences in these levels, um, the question is really, do we want to do this? And then it's sort of fine tuning that policy here on our first, our first pass. And my answer is, um, like I say, we're we're talking about asking every taxing entity altogether to put in a bit less than one percent of the appraised value, um, all predicted, projected, of course. But um, I I think this is an area. These specific parcels um, are are pretty critical to what we want a lot of the sort of Johnson Drive and adjacent development to look like going forward. And so, you know, do we think this is a good prototypical development, right? Is this is this a model that we want to see perhaps replicated in the future? Or at least do we think it's a good fit with what our vision, what our comp plan, what our land use plan is? And I, I think very much so. I, I think it's a, a very good development for the for the parcels that it's that it's going to sit on. Um so I'm all in favor of it. Um for me it's a question of let's let's dial in the policy and you know use this sort of first um abatement request to, to really shake out the details. Um, in my mind, I, I do think the target area deserves a little bit more, uh, I guess, uh, incentive than than what was initially shown at 5%. I think, like I say, these parcels are, are pretty spot on in terms of places that we want to consider, be very considerate with what gets built. And right now they're parking lots, right? And nothing. Um, I do think I'd, I'd like to see the attainable housing percentage of units be higher to get the full 10%. Um, so, you know, really what I've just said cancels each other out. The other one that I, that I wanted to touch on is I did do a little bit of reading on the environmental stuff. And, uh, this is just purely my own research, but I did share it with, with Laura and Sally. I was reading a report commissioned by one of the provincial governments in Canada to look at lead versus green globes. Um, seems to me that two globes is kind of the, the, what I, what I think they're suggesting that would be like the entry point, the equivalent to like a basic lead certification. So that would be what I would be looking for as a starting point for, for green globes, just on my own research. Um, so to that end, I'd, I'd like to see two globes before we kick in on the environmental portion. But again, the, the amounts aren't so important here to me as much as getting the policy dialed in where we want it. So thank you. Do you have a number for us? Yes. Uh, so I was able to pull up the affordable rents. So for the studio, it's uh, $1,077 a month. For one bedroom, it's basically $1,100. 
And for the two bedroom, it's uh, 1300, a little bit over $1,300. Uh, and the only other thing I wanted to point out uh, briefly was when you look at uh, the uh, report Bruce, uh, Bruce put together, he mentions in here the industry, industry threshold of 10 to 12% for multifamily projects similar to this type. And at the 70% abatement, we were at 10.26%. Um, and so I just wanted to stress that while you know a decrease in 2.5% might not sound like a significant amount uh, here, every day that this project drags on, the costs are going up, the interest rates are going up. And then when you add on to that, the reduced abatement, it it eventually it will get to that point where we're now below that industry threshold where it may potentially put the project at risk. So we would we would strongly uh, request and uh, hope that you all would consider it for the full 70%. Any other questions? I think just for whatever it's worth, part of our consideration and certainly every project of any size is important, um, but recognizing we're sort of um, driving this new policy with its training wheels on uh, still, uh, I think, uh, part of what we've talked about is being able to make some of these decisions and refine that thinking around a smaller project is probably beneficial as well, whether that is the longer term environmental impacts of just size of a building and, and those kinds of things. Um, but just wanted to point that out because it certainly has been part of the conversations that we've had internally. Hillary, go ahead. All right, last comment. I'm curious if staff is or staff or Bruce has had any conversations, um, which I I don't want to ask if Bruce isn't listening. I feel bad, but um, I'll, I can repeat myself if needed. Um, I'm curious. I, I understand that the 10 percent, you know, increasing affordable housing 10 percent upwards to 15 or 20 could obviously mess with their financial scenarios um, and even their lending scenarios. But I'm curious on the environmental piece, if they were to transition to say lead, um, if or if there's been conversations about that potential option and it maybe not having the financial impact um, quite as heavily as maybe the affordable housing piece. So just something to consider and wondering if there's been conversations about that. Or from one globe to two globes, I right. guess would be a similar question. I I I can tell you we haven't specifically had the conversation from one globe to two beyond the conversation that Mr. Kimmel and I have had as we've been trying to educate ourselves about um, what what gets you to that um, to that point. I I can't really speak to the developer. I know they've um, indicated concern over the cost of lead certification, but I don't know if, how much they've costed that you know costed that out. Yeah, okay. Mr. Moffat, did you? Yes, Mr. Moffat is more than welcome to. Thank you. Um, so, so to be clear, and I can get this to Laura, I'm remiss, I probably should have gotten this to her earlier, but everybody's asking about LEED versus Golden Close. Okay, so LEED has four levels. LEED certification, that's the entry level. Globes is level one. Those are basically the same. Then you go to silver, gold, and platinum for LEED, like the Johnson County buildings out in Olathe, those are platinum, Okay. And so that would be a four globe. So you can, in your mind, and I'll get you this, in your mind, you can say, well, a, a globe, one is a lead certification, a two is silver, then three is gold, and then four is platinum. That's how that, that's how they relate, basically. Well, I think that's what Mr. Chosey is saying. Some of the information that he's seen would suggest that it's not that one-to-one, -one, it is two globes to get you to the entry yeah, I, I think there's a lot of room, like you say, for some squishy interpretation. So it's hard to it's hard for anybody to scientifically nail that down. But that's what the suggestion was out of the report that I was reading. Um, I, I'm I'm certain you could get ten other reports and get ten other answers. So I, I'm I'm very much aware of you know one piece of data is one piece of data. Um, in general. My comment is that I, I think this is a good development on on the parcels that are being looked at. Um, and at this point, it's it's really fine tuning the knobs and and making sure we're all comfortable with our policy and that it works or or doesn't for the developer. So. Right. And we would agree with what you said, because all we've been doing is talking about analyticals here. And there is a human factor that everybody keeps forgetting. And, and I'm glad you brought up the rents. You know, we're going to put 77 homes in here okay call them units call them whatever they're homes whoever moves in there that's their home okay and they're going to become part of this 
community. And that means, and it's pedestrian friendly where this is, that means they're going to get up and walk back and forth and be part of your community. And that's what we're trying to bring forth here. And so we sit here and we're kind of trying to slice and dice this. Trust me, we slice and dice these numbers more than anybody in this room and, and with Bruce too. But when I came here in front of you, I don't know, a year or so ago, I asked everybody a question. What's prime interest rate? Back then, if anybody remembers, it, it, when we started our math, it was three and a half. Today, prime is? Okay, it's a huge impact. So we borrow at prime plus one. So we're borrowing at nine. Now, our best friend, Jerome Powell, didn't do anything at their meeting in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. But he said that at our next meeting, we're going to raise it again, okay? The banks are scrambling, too, because they have deposits they're paying, and they're not getting new deposits in. So there is a huge economic component here that when we say, well, we'll tweak this a little bit here or tweak a little bit there, it shouldn't be that big a deal. It is a big deal because this thing is so out of hand of where it was when we bought this ground nearly two years ago. And at that time, I think I told you that prime was at three or three and a half, and we ran all of our math at six, six and a half. So nine doesn't sound like that much, but it's 50% more. So there is a huge analytical economic impact, but these little numbers that we think we could tweak are, are going to you know, they're kind of the difference between a go and no go. And you, and if it's a no go, you've got mission gateway over here. You've got other guys that got ground tied up. I don't know what that does to the city. I really don't. But if it's a go, I know you got 77 homes here that will be part of your community. that will be going up and down those shops where I was just the other day having coffee. And that's what, that's what mission needs right now. They need to get something like this going because of the blight that's happened, not because of anybody in this room, but what's just happened by external factors. And we're all victim of that. So that's all I'd like to say. Yeah, Ben. Um, just in reaction to that, I, I will, I'll say I, I agree that time is of the essence. I, I, I work in title insurance with my day job. It's not, <laughs> business isn't pretty, right? Um, with the interest rate situation. Uh, and, and yes, I agree that this is a development that is going to provide some of those impacts that, that Mr. Moffat is standing up and, and saying, and, and that I want to see, you know, people living there, walking around, spending money, coming to the community center and so on. Um, so, yeah, like I say, for me, it's, it's a matter of, of policy, not so much numbers. Yeah. I'd like to echo council member Choji similarly. I mean, how much longer are we going to let these parcels, I guess, sit vacant where we're only collecting the 7% or 7,000, sorry, um, on a yearly, you know, basis where we could be collecting a lot more. So I guess, yeah, I'm in favor of kind of moving forward. And, and like Ben said, kind of fine tuning some of these numbers and moving forward on these pieces. So, yeah. yeah. I to like the project and would like it to see it go forward. But I think that we need to really think about this whole attainable housing piece. A thousand dollars for a studio is not really what I would consider working in social services affordable for someone who would live at a studio. And that's not anything to do with you. I'm just saying in general, I couldn't afford that on the salary that I make. <laughs> so if we're going to be talking about attainable housing, maybe this isn't the route to go. Maybe we need to figure out something else to bring that into mission. Because yes, this would be nice. And I'm sure that there will be families that this will help, but it's not solving the problem of affordable housing. It's making us feel good because it looks like we're doing something. Any other? I, I would yeah. I would offer just a couple of things. I do. I would echo the sentiment. I don't ever want a council to feel pressured uh, in terms of, I mean, time is money. We all know that. And time is money for the developers. And I always want to be respectful of that. But I also want to be respectful of council's time necessary to make a decision. I was going to offer something. I, I think there are some other ways. <clears throat> and while the council, I think the council has demonstrated consistently in your evaluation of incentives and granting of incentives that you are looking out for and protecting the financial interests of the city. I also think kind of following up on what council member Loudon has said and, and perhaps building on this theme of sustainability, maybe it's not in our tax abatement right. or any incentive policy where we need to be having those larger policy discussions about what are our goals related to attainable or affordable housing and sustainability? What are, 
because we can talk about two and a half percent or five percent or ten percent in an incentive policy on a 77 unit apartment project, you know, until we're all sort of brain dead. But if our goal is really impacting the built environment for years to come, what other ways can we do that as well as incentives? I think you want to provide some of that protection to communicate to developers, but I think there are some places where we could probably spend energy, effort and energy to address some of those more overarching goals. I agree with that, Lauren. I thought we had talked at one point about bringing some more of those options up to the table. Like, could you just give an update on where that's at? Yeah, yes, we have absolutely talked about bringing some of those conversations to the table. Um, and and sometimes we just get caught. I mean, trying to be respectful of the fact, you know, Mr. Moffat has waited a, a long time for us to kind of reach this point. Um, in defense of the city, I will say we were under the impression initially that this project wasn't going to require incentives. So we've played a little bit of catch up and trying mm -hmm. uh, to capture some of those things. But I do think that um, recognizing that and thinking about potential lost opportunity costs, as I look around the community and I look at um, whether it's the Martway office buildings or um, you know other things, how how long do we want to wait. And I think um, the mayor and I have had some really significant conversations around particularly the gateway project. We're willing to wait. We're not going to settle for something um, that our community do doesn't benefit our community. But I also think um, as we look and whether that relates to property maintenance or code enforcement or a variety of other things, um, you know, we've talked a little bit around the edges of with Script Pro selling off you know, three of these four parcels were script pro properties. Well, actually, I think they all four were by the end of the transaction. But <clears throat> they're they're not bringing people into the community every day like they were. They're they're not bringing people into shop at the you know retail shops and eat at the restaurants. And so, how, what are we doing? What can we do to help kind of rebuild and and support that all the way around? So it's I don't ever want to minimize the importance of you know, being good stewards of our fiscal resources. Um, but I, I don't know, you know, and we can certainly bring back additional information. I just need some direction on what else do you need to help move that decision forward. Um, that was me, okay. I was just going to say talking more about the target area. I mean, I know, I know our policy percentage and and this is, again, just talking about the little percentages, but given the conversation here and what we are trying to build around Johnson Drive, I think I could also be comfortable with the full 10%. You know, if you're talking about degrees of blight or potential blight, it gets a little like fuzzy. Okay, this project doesn't, you know, can't make the numbers work, doesn't go, then it sits, you know, five more years or whatever, like Mary said. Um, and I think just to, to Leah's point and what you said, Laura, I think you know, no single action that we going that we take is going to solve all of missions problems, let alone solve, you know, national problems like an environmental crisis or an affordable housing crisis. But I think if we can think of all the pieces that we're doing as moving towards a whole and moving towards that community vision and that, you know, every piece can chip away and, you know, move towards those goals. And I think we're going to have a lot more conversations when the comprehensive plan comes to us on, you know, does does the version that comes to us, um, you know, align with this vision of what we see for a thriving Johnson Drive and bringing in the people to support the, you know, the sit down restaurants and the other businesses we want to see? And does it afford the opportunities for that missing middle housing? And so I think, you know, it can get really depressing if you focus in on one thing, because one thing is never going to be enough. But I think this group has been really good about, you know, thinking about that vision and trying to move forward on that vision. So that's kind of an aside, but I think relevant to the conversation here and the comments from the developer as well on, you know, what are what are we trying to build? I, I think that's a good point. I think the more I think about it, the more I think of this policy as a, it's never going to give us like the all the all knowing answer to everything we ever wanted to do with a parcel right so it's a it's a guideline to to tell us is the developer meeting us halfway with our goals for for our land use and i think to this point we're probably here getting down into the two and a half percent you know plus or minus i i don't think it's probably worth thinking about that too much more um to that like i say i think what we're being asked here is 
uh, you know, let's uh, are we are we willing to ask every taxing entity to put in one hundred and seventy three thousand dollars for seventy seven homes with the the components we've talked about the the affordable units and the and the environmental design. Um, I, I think the benefit has been clearly demonstrated by a number of parties. And, um, you know, if you look at, at the, the work session packet um, of all the taxing entities, you know, mission is going to be the one that's taking it the hardest. You know, we have a 6% return on investment predicted. Um, you know, the school district is the one that's going to take the least of the blow. So um, I think that's, that's probably how we would want to stack it up. If I, if I'm guessing where each of you might sit on that question. Um to, to that end, I'm willing and ready to make a recommendation if you all are finished with the discussion. Anybody else have any advice then? Yeah, please I recommend we take uh, we take the abatement question to council um, at seventy percent. I don't I don't think I'm in the mood to twist the knobs all night. So. No, I agree. Yeah. The target area because I totally agree with that. Again, let me just talk yeah. very briefly about process. So what we would imagine is now we can go back and at least plug in tentatively these numbers and refine. We've got a draft essentially of a performance agreement. We've been trading comments with, with the developer. So we should be able, um, you know, again, middle of next week at the latest to get kind of that complete packet. So you've got a full week to review that Um it's going to be very similar to kind of what you've seen. There's not a lot of new information to, to review. There's a resolution of intent. Um, you know, one of the pieces, and we've talked about this, but we've talked about the resolution of intent um, it would expire if construction doesn't commence uh, within a certain time period. So I know it's different than some of the milestones that we're looking at, but there will also be some schedule uh, milestones in, in the performance agreement. We'll highlight all of those pieces for you to look at. We would um, suggest that we um, will have a presentation and we'll do the public hearing at your meeting on the 18th. In, um, if you're comfortable voting then, um, that would certainly, I think, please, Mr. Moffitt and his team, if not, we can look at, um, we have a work session scheduled for the following Wednesday. Um, I think it looked like attendance would allow for a quorum. So we could certainly, if you weren't comfortable on the 18th, uh, we would have another opportunity in a week to come back and try to resolve any of that uh, for you. Yeah. All right. And, and thank you all for being here um, and having that discussion. Okay. Um, our next action item tonight is for consideration of an automated license plate reader policy from Chief Madden. Thank you. And we are in kind of the last final phases of things we need to put in place for our ALPR systems. And one of those things we've discussed in, in numerous conversations we've had over this topic is uh, bringing to council the police department policy that would be related to the usage of this, of this technology. And hearing some of the questions, concerns that have that have come up in those meetings um, are, as, as, as most of you know, our policy management system is called Lexipol. And then they had a model policy in there that we were able to update to include some of the, uh, just to clarify some of the items that were of concern with you all over the past um, year or so. And that included the data retention, um, a stipulation that officers won't receive notifications in their vehicles of misdemeanor traffic related warrants, um, and requirement that if an officer enters, self enters a license plate into the system to a, that would then alert them if that license plate came across one of our license plate readers, that it would they would be required to enter a reason into a field so that there'd be some sort of an audit trail and also be uh, need to uh, remove that data once the situation for which they entered it in the first place was resolved. Um, and then also it, it contemplates the management of the data as far as who it can be released to. Um, 
the system that we we're be, uh, going on to is is called Web ALPR, and that is kind of a regional system. And that's one of the things that makes the system powerful is that we'll, we'll, we won't just, when we won't be getting data from just mission, uh, likewise, the other uh, agencies that use the same system would be getting our data. And that just assists in, in the uh, resolution and prevention of, of crime. And the other thing I want to make sure I point out is in within the past few legislative sessions, the state has expressly taken out uh, license plate data from open records requests. It, it's it's something that we we don't have to uh, we don't have to provide uh, open records request with that kind of data, and it's it's very clear in in statute. So. I'd be happy to answer any questions related to the policy if anybody has some. Yep. I'm okay with the policy. The only question I had was in the one item where you said that the member who entered the license plate into the ALPR database shall be responsible for removing the license plate if and when the reason for entry has been resolved. You may not have the person, the same person that did that at the time it's resolved. And so it's just a practicality. Right. And, right. and, and most of that, there, there are a few reasons why you would do that. And the most likely of reasons that that would even occur in the first place is, say, you know, at two o'clock in the morning, dispatch um, notifies you that another jurisdiction had a crime and they have license plate information. So that, that officer can then enter that data into the system. And if that license plate, if if we find out that that person, you know, was taken into custody and that situation's resolved, they then can remove it. But they wouldn't leave perpetually searches in there. It's kind of, sh of a short term, right? Right, but I, think, but I think your point is practically it might not, I don't know if there's another way to say it so that it talks about it, it it could be a much shorter period of time that it could be removed it doesn't necessarily have to be the exact person who entered it or is that there a reason um, for that in the policy that i mean i think that was part of your question right like somebody might take correct. another job or be it's out right. oh, it's yeah. a minor on leave, issue, but no, they would they once uh once if somebody left the agency then their data would be removed uh, and their access would be removed. And, you know, some of these questions I can't give you a definitive answer on because we don't have the system yet to know exactly how it works. Um, so we've seen demos and, and looked at it, but but until we, we actually get our hands on it and are able to in there, we just have to see how that plays out. And, and that's the other thing that I wanted to point out with the policy, because we're bringing uh, our policy to you for approval. If we make any substant substantive uh, changes to that, we would then be bringing that policy back. Now, um, you know, Lexapol updates policies very regularly, and so we're going to have to look at that. And you know, what I mean, you know, if they add a, if they add a comma in there, we probably wouldn't be bringing that back to you. But if we're changing the whole way we're going to maneuver this system, we're definitely going to come and uh, talk with you again about about those changes. Let's do Ben. Yeah, Chief, I think the policy has done, done a really good job of, of um, threading a needle really carefully here. So I I, I like what I see in the policy. Um, I, I specifically, I hadn't, I, I, like you say, how do you think through all of this until you start using it? So I, I do think a great deal of this will be what happens after the first six, 12 months and in, in retrospective, see how the system is being used and see if there are any issues. Um, but I thought it was especially important that, that this policy calls out, you know, what action are you taking based solely on a, on a license plate alert that perhaps you yourself have in, like entered that doesn't necessarily give you any kind of um, suspicion or, or cause to do anything other than you typed in a license plate and it popped back up in your face. So I like that that's being thought about carefully. Thanks yeah. chief. Thank you. 
Um, my question just, so again, this information is accessible to mission and surrounding counties, nothing higher, like the FBI come in, someone else, I mean, how no, far this, outside of our locale? I mean, the the only agencies that are on are the agencies that have the the, the system, okay. and it's not one of the national, this is, it's, this is a horrible term to say when you're talking about software, but homegrown uh, type of regional software that, that kind of started in Kansas City, Missouri, and they've had a lot of success with it and kind of, and, and the success by adding additional, by, you know, expanding your reach only, only expands the success of the system. So, um, you know, uh, if there was, but as far as direct access is only the ac the agencies that have that pay for the web ALPR subscription, and in, in that are in this region. So state or federal. Not direct access, if, you know, and to, to that's but you know to my knowledge that there's there are other federal systems that that data goes into, and that's not what this system is. Okay. Thanks, Mary. Uh, I'm in favor of this policy. I think it's a good attempt to kind of craft out, like Ben was saying, things that we don't know in practice yet. I was just going to ask you if it weren't too much of a burden, if you did happen to know of any notable incidents or cases that you could share with us down the road. This specifically was able to happen because of this usage. I'd be really interested to know any downstream impacts of using this that wasn't kind of an onerous burden on you to draft up. So. Absolutely. We plan on trying to trying to make sure that we're documenting all of our successes um, and, and passing those along with whatever information we can pass along. And I, I think similarly, it, it would be really nice after uh, whatever, six or 12 months or whatever period we think is reasonable to just get some aggregate data on, on how the system is being used and and so on. Again, nothing that's going to require you to stay up three nights in a row putting together a report, but hopefully that if you're building a piece of software like this, it's already sort of geared towards that. I hope <laughs> that'd be, it'd be just nice to, to have a retrospective on this. Absolutely. We'll... I recommend that we take this to consent. Um, our final action item tonight is for consideration of an MOU with the Johnson County Sheriff's Office for automatic license plate reader data storage, also from Chief Mavic. Thank you. Same topic, a little bit different twist. Do I, as as we move forward with the process of um, figuring out where we wanted our infrastructure to be placed and using using you know our data to support that. Um, kind of go along with the team concept that makes it that makes this the software so powerful um what makes it powerful is the data and the data is what is an ongoing expense that uh, uh that needs to be maintained and um with our partnerships with other agencies in the sheriff's office they have agreed to uh, host that data so every small agency isn't in a server business um and it provides some efficiencies along those lines. And as part of that, we want to make sure that we have an agreement in place that outlines both both the city's and, and the county's responsibility in doing that. And um, there, this MOU provides a lot of the same topics, a lot of the same aspects that, that you all were concerned about as far as proper access, making sure that we're notifying them if we know that we have somebody that messed up um, notifying uh, yeah. us if they have any incidents that, that occur um, and making sure that communication is open. And it, as well as the policy, this dot also contemplates a 24 month data retention maximum and which will be us, which will be consistently kind of uh, massaged to figure out where that sweet spot is compared to data and storage space. So um, that's that's one of the components in it, but it's but it's spelled out as a 24 month maximum. And as well as in our policy in the MOU, we do have control of our data should we need to modify or delete as as we so choose or see fit. 
Um, there, there are no initially. There's going to be no cost to the city for this for this arrangement, and in the MOU, it contemplates going through and making sure that it, they're going to do a yearly assessment to figure out, you know, is you know, is mission taking up fifty percent of our server, you know, kind of those kind of conversations and and analysis, and then you know, if if we are in fact taking up fifty percent of the server, maybe having to have a conversation with us about what what we're going to contribute for that. So um, at this point, that's not uh, in the cards, but it could be down the future and and we'll have those conversations if it comes up. Um, also just want to make sure that everybody knows that our legal counsel did review the MOU and, and had a couple, and that, the money part was one of the things that they came back and asked, you know, said, and and you know the MOU doesn't spell out clearly that it, we're not having a charge at this time, but um, but we so we don't have a potential cost for something that's currently free. Okay. Questions? Yeah, so one one thing I think that's vital is that the MOU says we can at any time update or delete the information we've contributed to the database. So. Um, I, I don't know. I, I don't see any consideration given to what might happen if this MOU is ever terminated for some reason. Can we still go back and delete our data in that case? And I'm sort of looking at the lawyer in the room because <laughs> I don't know how that works. I would say, I would say, timing of a termination agreement and a decision to delete information yeah. might be um, appropriately coordinated. Okay. And I think we'd have the opportunity if we so desired if if we were going to move our our data from their server to yeah. our own server that that would just be a transfer and then um for whatever period of time we wanted to go back and and capture okay yeah seems reasonable to me do you want to recommend go for it you seem like you're ready <laughs> recommend consent thank you thank you and we have no discussion items this evening um, finally, this evening, we have our department updates. Ms. Smith, are there any department updates for the finance and administration? No, I can't imagine <laughs> anything more we should talk about, yeah. except hoping that Brian is having a wonderful time on vacation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, with that, it is now 9.04 p.m. And with no further discussion, that concludes the meeting of the Finance and Administration Committee. Again, this video will be made public on our website at missionks.org. Thanks. <laughs>